anatomy and physiology students. Welcome to our second lecture on CMT, cells, membranes, and transport. We did a bunch of stuff last time. We're going to pick up right where we left off, and we are going to start to discuss how things actually get through the cell membrane. You'll notice on the screen here, I have a phospholipid bilayer, beautiful phospholipid bilayer right there. This phospholipid bilayer, like your cell membrane, is going to exhibit some selective permeability. What this means is that certain things can get through and certain things cannot. Things that generally go through, oxygen, CO2, small nonpolar molecules, Basically, if a molecule is nonpolar, so if you have a nonpolar molecule, that is more or less another way of saying that it is hydrophobic. So things that are hydrophobic, let's write that out, can zip on through. Now, occasionally, small number of water molecules, okay, can sneak through the cell membranes, just, just a few of these guys. So those are things that generally go through. Now other stuff like glucose and similar polar water soluble molecules, if something is polar it is hydrophilic, plus things like ions, ions are all charged so they're all going to be hydrophilic and water soluble, plus water molecules large amounts of water molecules. These things do not easily go through the membrane. So the membrane is exhibiting selective permeability. Now, of course, the whole idea is we got to have the right stuff in the inside, the right stuff on the outside. Without selective permeability, this homeostasis of the cell would not be possible. All right. Let's start figuring out how things do go through. Let's do that. Now, when we're talking about moving things, transporting things through a membrane, there are two types of membrane transport. It can be passive and it can be active. There is a simple difference between passive and active transport. In active transport, the cell is going to use something, the cell is going to use ATP. Cell uses ATP to move something through. That's active transport. Of course, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the energy currency of the cell. Passive processes do not require the cell do not require the cell to use ATP. That does not mean that there is no energy involved. It just doesn't mean that this, it just means that the cell is not breaking down ATP. Okay, well, we're gonna do some passive processes first, and then we're gonna do some active processes after that, and then we'll be done with cell membranes and transport and stuff. All right, in this picture, I have a phospholipid bilayer right here, a cell membrane right here. There it is. I got some purple things, some orange purple circles, some orange triangles, and some blue circles. The purple th circles are going right through the membrane. We just kind of talked about things that can do that. Oxygen, CO2 non-polar hydrophobic things. My orange and my blue things are going through the cell membrane, but they're using a protein, an, an integral protein, a transmembrane protein, either as a channel or a shape-changing carrier to get through. Now, all three of these entrances of these molecules into the cell are an example of passive transport because in all three we're going from where there are more of the stuff 
to where there is less of the stuff. More purples on the outside, fewer on the inside. More oranges on the outside, fewer on the inside. More blues on the outside, fewer on the inside. So we are moving down our gradient. In passive processes, things move down their gradient. What kind of gradient? You may be wondering. The gradient we're talking about is a concentration gradient. This is a concentration gradient. You go from where things are in a high concentration to where things are in a low concentration. If you're going in that downhill direction, it is going to be passive transport. The cell is not going to have to expend its energy reserves. So from high to low concentration, that's going to be passive transport. Now, if we're going up the gradient, so look, on the outside of the cell, I got one, two orange diamonds. On the inside, I got two, five, seven orange diamonds. We're going from where there are two to where there are seven. That is going up our concentration gradient. The analogy is we're going uphill. To go uphill requires energy. And we see ATP is about to get broken down by this protein. And then when ATP, by the way, let's just review for a second. Go back to general bio here. When ATP is broken down, so let's say you have a molecule of ATP, you break it down. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, breaks down to ADP, adenosine diphosphate, plus an inorganic phosphate group. And this is going to release energy, big E for energy. So the energy that's released from the breakdown of that ATP is going to be used to pump the orange diamonds from where there are less of them to where there are more of them. All right. Cool, cool. Now, let's talk passive processes. Passive processes are where we're going from a high concentration towards where we're going towards a low concentration. This movement that we see in this example, a drop of dye is dropped into a beaker of water. The dye spreads because there's a lot right there and there's very little over there. That movement from high to low concentration is caused by diffusion. Here's the thing. Unless you're at absolute zero, unless you're at, what, negative 273 degrees Celsius, stuff is always moving. Molecules in a liquid and gla and, or a gas are literally moving. Molecules in the solid are shaking. D and because molecules are always moving, they will have a tendency to spread out. When you have a bunch over here and the molecules are randomly dancing, some will start ending up over here. Once they're spread out, they don't stop moving, but every time one goes to the left, one goes to the right, and vice versa. And this process of movement from a high to a low concentration, because of the innate molecular movement that we have at any temperature, is known as diffusion. Now, why does, what drives diffusion? Why do molecules shake about? Well, molecules are going to shake about because they have a particular type of energy. The energy that you're familiar with is you go down a fun roller coaster ride. That energy is kinetic energy. Now, this creates another question. Okay, why do these molecules have kinetic energy? They have kinetic energy because they have heat, basically. This is a simplification, but that's the general idea. You heat something up, you get more molecular movement, you get faster diffusion. So kinetic energy is going to be proportional, there's my proportional symbol, to temperature. More temperature, more kinetic energy, more kinetic energy, better diffusion. All right. On.
on that note, I got two beakers up here. I got two beakers up here. The same amount of purple dye was dropped in the beaker on the left and the beaker on the right. The same exact time. It was, it was beautifully synchronized. Same amount of dye, same amount of water, same time of dropping, same time elapsed, but one dye, diff, one of the beakers had the dye diffuse better. One of them had the dye diffuse not quite as well. So which of these beakers, beaker A, whoops, shoot, beaker A, there we go, or beaker B, which is the colder one? If you're at home, shout it out loud enough so someone can hear you. Let them know that you're studying some anatomy and physiology. So the answer is, I think I've given you enough time. The answer is the colder one is B. B is colder, colder temperature, less kinetic energy, slower diffusion, and we see that. However, there is something else we have to consider. Something else we have to consider is the size of the diffusing molecule. Okay? The size of the thing diffusing. And this has kind of a, just an intuitive sense. Things that are smaller tend to diffuse faster. Things that are larger tend to diffuse more slowly. If you want to do the math on it, and I bet you probably do. I know you do, right? Kinetic energy is... Go back to physics class. Let's go back to physics class for a second. One half times the mass times the velocity squared. So if if the mass, if this if this part gets bigger, the velocity has to get smaller. So heavier things go more slowly. Lighter things go more quickly. So we dropped a pair of dyes, same amount of dyes into this petri dish. And the dye is spread through the, the agar that's in the dish here. Which dye was heavier? Well, the one that was heavier is going to be this bluish green one. It's heavier, so it spread more slowly. Bigger things diffuse more slowly. So we got a couple things that affect diffusion. Well, first of all, diffusion is the movement of things down a concentration gradient from a region of high to a region of low concentration. Temperature makes things diffuse faster. Molecular size, if molecular size goes up, diffusion goes down. One other thing that does matter is the size of the gradient. So if your high to low gradient is a steep triangle here, things will go faster than if your high to low gradient was had you know had a smaller slope to it. All right. Diffusion is great, by the way. Diffusion is how oxygen gets from your air in your lungs into your blood. It's how CO2 goes from your blood to the air in your lungs. It's how oxygen and CO2 are exchanged between cells and blood. Diffusion is ridiculously awesome. You use it for countless types of exchange, and you do not require energy to do it. There's only one problem with diffusion, though. One little problem with diffusion. It's bad when you're moving things long distances. Okay, diffusion is good for moving things short distances. I just said diffusion is good for gas exchange in your lungs. Think about the epithelium that you have in your lungs. What type of epithelium do you have? Let me draw an epithelial cell from your lungs, from your lung alveoli. There's an epithelial cell from your lung alveoli. There's another one. Uh, 
I'm going to draw a capillary cell right next to it. Here's a lung capillary. I'm going to draw it. Bear with me as I draw these cells here. These are both simple squamous epithelium. So separating air from blood is simple squamous epithelium. Oxygen can go right through that. CO2 can go the other way. And it works beautifully because the simple squamous epithelia are so darn skinny. If they were really thick, that would be bad. If you get a buildup of mucus, I don't want that color, let's do a different color. If you get a buildup of mucus right here on the inside of your simple squamous helium, epithelium, there we go. If you get a buildup of mucus here, the effective distance that diffusion has to go through becomes greater, and it's just harder for that to do to, to occur. This is a heart right here. Doesn't look like a heart. I bet I don't know if you would have guessed heart. You know, you think about a heart, there's a heart shape. Or maybe you think about a heart like more anatomically, you're like, oh, there's a heart or a strawberry right there. Okay, this is a heart that was sliced transversely and the thing is this heart wall should not be this thick it became really hard for all the cells in here to get enough oxygen because the wall got so thick the blood vessels the plumbing didn't grow enough as the wall grew thick this person actually died of a heart attack not a good sitch all right wow it's good stuff. I'm getting excited here. I'm sure you guys are just getting excited too. I hope so. All right. Where were we? Diffusion. Now, there's actually two kinds of diffusion that we do across the cell membrane. One's called simple diffusion. One's called facilitated. Whether a molecule does simple or facilitated depends on how much it loves water. So hydrophilic molecules will do one of these hydrophobics, we'll do another. Okay, let's figure it out. Simple diffusion. Oxygen, CO2, and hydrophobic things do simple diffusion. Simple means there's no help needed. It doesn't require any proteins. Oxygen diffuses right through the cell membrane from the outside to the inside. It does not require any protein as a channel or carrier. CO2 diffuses the opposite direction, right through the cell membrane from, out, from inside to outside. Notice in both situations here, the direction is from high to low, from high to low. So oxygen, CO2, hydrophobic stuff does this. Hydrophobic nonpolar things, examples would include steroids, you might be thinking, but I don't take steroids. Well, you still have steroids in your body. I mean, if you're if you're uh, if you have testicles, you probably have a lot of testosterone. If you have ovaries, you probably have either a lot of estrogen or a lot of progesterone, depending on what time in the cycle you're currently at. Plus, um, fat soluble vitamins. Do you know your fat soluble vitamins? So your fat-soluble vitamins are vitamin K, vi sorry, vitamin A, vitamin K, vitamin E, and vitamin D. I always just remember the word naked, and then I get rid of the N, and you've got A, K, E, and D. All right, so simple diffusion, things simply go right through the membrane. They don't require any help at all. Facilitated diffusion requires help. I mean, to facilitate means to help, right? So facilitated diffusion requires help. Help either in the form of a, no, not either, there's no either. Help in the form of a protein. Okay, a transmembrane protein. And maybe it's a channel like this or a carrier like we're about to see. Things that go through channels or carriers can't go through the membrane without help because they're hydrophilic. So, this protein here,
has a watery channel running through it. And the sodium molecules can just slip right through the sodium leak channels and perfect, they go from outside to inside. By the way, this is the way sodium always goes from the outside to the inside. Store that fact away in your hippocampus for later, okay? Now, notice again, high, low concentration. Sodium going in through a sodium leak channel. If we look over here, potassium going from out from inside to outside, high to low. Potassium is charged, so it can't just go through the membrane, so we have a watery channel through which it can pass. And also store this fact away. Potassium tends to leak out. Sodium tends to leak in. Okay. There's another way. Carriers. Carriers are like channels, but they're, they're shape changers. So, for example, we have glucose on the outside of the cell right here. Less glucose on the inside. This is a glucose carrier protein. It grabs the glucose on one side, morphs its shape, and then spits the glucose out on the other side. It's still diffusion. We're still going from high, from high to low. Glucose is hydrophilic, it's polar, it dissolves in water, it will not simply diffuse. Alright, one thing we have to consider when we're talking about carrier proteins is there are only so many carrier proteins. There is a finite number that <coughs> you can't, you don't have an infinite number, you have a finite number, only so many, right? So that means you, when you're doing carrier proteins to move something, there's going to be a, a peak move, a peak rate of movement. I mean, the carrier proteins, you only have, let's say you only had 10, and those 10 can only work so fast. Well, you're going to have a, a limit to how fast you can move stuff in. We can express this well with a graph. If we look at this graph here, if something is being uptaken by a cell via simple diffusion, as you have a greater concentration gradient down here, it goes into the cell faster and faster and faster. If you're doing facilitated diffusion with a carrier, as you have a bigger and bigger concentration gradient, eventually the rate of uptake levels off. Because there's only so many carrier proteins, and eventually they're going to get saturated, meaning they're all working as fast, and they're all occupied. And you can't get any faster. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. One other thing about channels and carriers, they can be selective. We can have bigger and smaller channels to restrict things by size, or channels that have certain charges on them. Like some channels will only allow negative ions to go through. Some will only allow positive ions to go through. Okay? So that's kind of cool because, again, that's going to help us maintain homeostasis, getting the right stuff inside and the right stuff outside. All right. Time to talk about a special type of diffusion. The diffusion of water through the plasma membrane is known as osmosis. So what I see here, I got my lipid bilayer. I even I cut it off, but you know lip bill stands for lipid bilayer. And made of phospholipids, gorgeous. I have an integral protein in here. This integral protein is called an aquaporin. It is a channel protein for water. So these water molecules are going to move from higher concentration to lower concentration through the membrane. Most of them go through the aquaporin. The occasional one will go directly through the membrane. Do you remember how phospholipids can kind of shake and dance a little bit? They're not static. We said that in the previous CMT lecture. Well, if this phospholipid dances a little bit to our left, and this one dances a little bit to our right, a water molecule can zip through. 
So, the diffusion of water through the plasma membrane is osmosis. It happens primarily via transmembrane proteins like aquaporins. All right. Let's look at some osmosis here, okay? I have a U-shaped glass. There is water in it. There is a barrier, a membrane barrier, that allows water to pass, but not sugar. There's sugar on the right. There's sugar on the left. There's less sugar on the left. Another way of saying this is that there's more water on the left. There's a higher water concentration here, lower here. So water's going to go this way, from left to right. Water's going to go from left to right. And that movement of water is called osmosis. A good thing to remember is particles suck. What that's telling you is water will go to where there is a higher concentration of particles. Higher concentration of particles. Now, osmo why are we talking about osmosis? Well, intra- and extracellular fluids are both made of water. Water is going to go in and out of cells. If too much water goes into a cell, it can swell and burst. If too much water leaves a cell, it can shrink. You shrink, you lose your shape, you lose your shape, you lose your job, you lose your job, you can die. Okay, particles suck. Let's keep going. There we go. One thing we can do is we can describe solutions by how they affect the movement of water into or out of a cell. So we're going to drop a cell into three different solutions, or and we're going to see what happens to that cell. And we're going to call those three different solutions either hypotonic, isotonic, or hypertonic. Now, this matters to us because we drink liquids. We get IV fluids sometimes. And if those liquids and IV fluids, they can have an effect on the shape of our cells. They could be hypo, iso, or hypertonic. All right. First up, an isotonic solution. So let's say we put a red blood cell right there in an isotonic solution. In an isotonic solution, iso means the same. So the particle concentration, brackets means concentration, the particle concentration in the solution is the same as that of the cell. So there's no difference in particle concentration. This means there's no difference in water concentration. Every time a water molecule goes out, a water molecule goes in, the cell doesn't change size. Delta here means change. Cell doesn't change size. And the solution is said to be isotonic. Same stretchiness. Same stretch. The cell hasn't been, the cell membrane hasn't been stretched more or less by entering water or leaving water. A lot of um, IV fluids are isotonic, so they do not affect the change in cell size. Okay, what if we had a different solution? Now we're going to put our red blood cell in a hypertonic solution. Hyper means more, greater. So the solution particle concentration is greater than the cells. So the solution has more particles, which means the solution has less water. So there's less water outside. This means water tends to exit. As water exits, the cell gets smaller red blood cell losing its shape. You lose your shape, you lose your function. And this drop in cell size is known as crenation. That's the fancy word, beautiful word, crenation. Um, all right, one more to do. The last one we're going to do 
is a hypotonic solution. Hypotonic solution, hypo means less, lower. So the solution's particle concentration is less than that of the cells. So the solution has a lower particle concentration, which means it has a higher water concentration. So the concentration of water is higher outside and lower inside. So water goes in more than it goes out. The cell swells. There is a the potential for the cell to burst open and the cellular bursting is called lysis. Whoops. All right. Let's talk about Kwashiorkor. Maybe you're familiar, maybe you've seen pictures of these poor kids right here in such a situation. If there is some serious famine, serious mal malnutrition, the concentration of protein in the blood goes down. Because if you're not eating, your liver has a hard time making blood proteins. So all of a sudden, the particle concentration in the blood is less than the particle concentration in the interstitial fluid. So that means the blood has a higher concentration of water, so water tends to leave the blood vessels and go into the surrounding tissue space, especially in the ventral body cavity, especially in the abdominal pelvic body cavity. And we see the swelling because of the fluid that results. Okay. Fantastic. We're done with passive transport, guys. This is really good. Give yourself a little round of applause right, th right here. Pat yourself on the back because you're struggling through we're half an hour deep into this lecture here. But we're almost done. I don't want to stop now. Active transport. Remember, active transport requires energy in the form of ATP. We are going to discuss two of the basic types of active transport. There are others later on when you take cell biology. You can do them. The two we're going to discuss, one's called primary active transport, and one is called vesicular transport. All right, well, I have no idea where we were. My phone was just ringing. Broke the cardinal rule of recording a lecture. Did not have my phone on silent. Mea culpa. Sorry about that. That's so funny. That's hilarious. Anyway, there are two basic types of active transport, primary and vesicular. Now, both of these are going to require ATP to work. And remember, if you're requiring ATP, that means you are moving things uphill against the concentration gradient. You're taking things from a low towards a high concentration gradient. All right, primary active transport. That's where a protein, a transmembrane protein, is going to break down ATP. There we see that reaction we saw earlier, ATP being broken down to ADP and an inorganic phosphate. The energy release in that is used to move a molecule from a, from a low concentration to a high concentration, up the gradient. That's primary active transport. Pretty straightforward. Now, a great example of this, that is just ubiquitous in your body. It's crazy ubiquitous. It's the word of the day, ubiquitous. This protein is called the sodium potassium pump. It is an active transport protein. It is especially important for muscle and nerve cells. Okay? You use, seriously, 40% of your energy that you get from food goes towards these proteins. What it does is it breaks down a molecule of ATP and moves three sodium molecules out and two potassium molecules in. The purpose of this is to maintain high levels of extracellular sodium and high levels of intracellular potassium. We actually saw this earlier. We were talking about potassium and sodium. Sodium's high on the outside, potassium's high on the inside. 
sodium potassium pump great example of active transport when we get to muscle and nerve cells we will revisit this and I was about to say I'll ask you about it but we're not really in class so yeah anyhow let's now talk about vesicular transport vesicular transport is when you move things in or out with these little bags of membrane called vesicles and usually you're doing moving large amounts either in or out and that's why you require a vesicle a membrane bag moving stuff in with vesicles is called endocytosis moving stuff out with vesicles is called exocytosis okay whoops there we go I'm giving you an example of exocytosis here this is the inside of the cell there are five red things that we need to get to the outside of the cell so what's happened here is the five little red things have been encased in a membrane bag it's like a tiny little cell membrane right here phospholipid bilayer and the endoplasmic reticulum and other organelle called the Golgi apparatus have done this they've created the situation here now what I want you to see is there is a purple integral protein in this secretory vesicle there is also a pink integral protein up here in the cell membrane and the arms of these proteins are going to intertwine and then once that happens because the phospholipid bilayer both of these are dynamic fluid things as they get pulled towards one another they are going to fuse together and you can see what's happening here all of a sudden the five red things are now exposed to the outside and are able to just diffuse away this is exocytosis now what's not pictured here is all the ATP involved in the grabbing and twisting and twining of the proteins so that's why this is active transport if you did lab number four already the stratified epithelial labs we talked about marocrine sweat glands marocrine sweat glands secrete their sweat by means of exocytosis if you did lab three we saw goblet cells in the small intestine and the trachea goblet cells secrete mucus by means of exocytosis all right there are actually two types of endocytosis that we're going to discuss here one is called receptor mediated endocytosis and the other is called phagocytosis let's do receptor mediated first receptor mediated endocytosis is a way that cells can specifically grab on to particular things and then engulf them so I got a cell right here we're zooming in on that little square right there there's the phospholipid bilayer dun, 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 dun. got some proteins acting as receptors they're grabbing the blue things they're specific to it and then once they've grabbed a bunch the membrane starts to dip inward proteins are going to make it do that then once the membrane dips inward once the membrane dips inward the two ends right here are going to join and we've created a vesicle and the blue things are now inside the cell this is good because it lets us bring specific things in which is important for homeostasis all right last type of endocytosis is the special kind called phagocytosis it's performed by white blood cells which are important for your immune system as well as macrophages phago means eating so cellular cellular eating a macrophage is a big eater and so we're zooming in the square here the white blood cell or macrophage sticks out these two membranous arms called pseudopods and that's going to require energy and anytime we're moving the membrane to make these vesicles 
is going to require energy, and the pseudopods stick out, then the two hands of the pseudopods are going to join, and boom, we've created a vesicle with whatever microbe, debris, dead cell, whatever it might be. We've eaten it. And yes, with that, video number two on cells, membrane, and transport is finally finished. A fast 40 minutes. Hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Definitely. And I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.